Chris Godinas, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday at noon on YouTube, and then I post it back up to Facebook. Uh, this video is for educational and informational purposes only. If you feel you need a therapist, please go to Google, type in Therapy Your City, Psychology Today will pop up, click on that, and it will have all of the therapists in your area. Also, the views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other damn therapist for that matter. Boom, shakalaka, done. Okay, so I was going to answer all of these questions on Sunday because I thought you're into the year. Let's, you know, you're in clearance. Let's get everything out of the inbox. But I kind of thought, you know what, I think I'd rather just go ahead and answer these questions now in this video. And then on Sunday, I'm going to answer whatever questions you guys have because I want to talk more about, you know, hoovering and year-end resolutions and how not to set yourself up for failure and all that sort of good stuff. So, um, all right, so I'm just going to dive right into this. Um, what is splitting, i.e. black and white thinking? Okay, so splitting happens a lot with personality disorders, it and especially borderline. So what it is, it, and addictions. So and, well, this is all going to tie back into itself in just a minute here because there was a question on addictions and gastric bypasses that I wanted to answer as well. So when somebody has got rigid thinking, okay, like really, really, really rigid thinking. So everything is black, white, good, bad, all, nothing. It's like one end of the spectrum or the other. There's no middle ground and there's an inability to see another person's point of view. So um, splitting is when somebody is very black and white in their thinking. It's all good. It's all bad. It's all this. It's all that. It's, it's, there's no kind of like you know, middle ground at all in any way, shape, or form. So um, splitting is a very unhealthy way to think because the world is not black and white. I mean, you now there are obviously some instances where it's like, oh no, this is evil, no two ways about it. But in a lot of things, and especially in everyday life, and especially in a relationship, there's going to be back and forth. There's, you're not going to agree on everything all the time. There's going to be need to have discussion. But when you're dealing with somebody who is black, white, good, bad, all, nothing, there is no discussion and that's not healthy or normal. So splitting is when somebody goes from one end of the spectrum over to the other end of the, or, you know, one, one end of the spectrum or other, okay? So they're, they're like over here or they're over here. There's no middle ground. And that's called splitting. It's not healthy. It's not normal. It is often found in borderline personality disorder partly because the person doesn't have a clear sense of who they are and so when they grab onto something it's like Ooh, this is it this is it this is it period and that's not healthy that's not healthy that's not normal so anyway that is splitting i hope that answers the question the next question is um why do people men and women um self-harm themselves um, and is um, BDSM, bondage uh, sadomasochism, harmful? Okay, I've answered that in a, in a previous video on uh, BDSM. It, here's the thing, guys. Things are only a problem when they're a problem. I'm going to answer that part of the question first, and I'm going to go back to self-harm. So things are only a problem when they are a problem. And there's lots of couples that engage in fantasy play. And it's, you know, it can involve bondage, it can involve a little bit of discipline, it can involve whatever. It's only a problem if it's a problem. In other words, if the person is getting damaged or if it's not being done consensually or, you know, if this is somehow playing into something that's, you know, not healthy for them, then yeah, then it's a problem. But it's only a problem when it's a problem. Does that make sense? So not everybody who engages in... Um, in sexual play that is bondage and discipline is necessarily unhealthy. It is only unhealthy if somebody is getting harmed, okay? So is that a part of a personality disorder? It can be. Some people do engage in very dangerous activities when they have a personality disorder because it all goes back to lack of self-esteem. Now, I'm not saying that people that engage in BDMS, BD, B, hmm, Bondage and discipline, SM, BDSM, <laughs> are um, losing or lacking self-esteem. There's a lot of people with great self-esteem that participate in that. But when somebody is doing it to be humiliated and it's harming them, then it's an issue, if that makes sense. And that is sometimes the case when people have got personality disorders, because especially in borderline personality disorder, there's a really low sense of self-esteem because of the trauma that has happened earlier. And that can be very harmful to somebody if they have not worked on that original trauma. And if they're trying to work it out through that play, it may be very uh, self-harming. So there is that. Um, self-harming. Why, why? Why? Why do people self-harm? 
Okay. When somebody is not allowed to have emotions, okay, it's, it's not safe for them. And so one of the ways that they do that is to cut. Okay, so cutting, you feel it. It hurts. You feel it. And you see it. And it bleeds. And that's one way that they are allowed to have emotions. And it's, it's not a suicidal gesture. It's that they've become numb and they want to feel. And that's one way that was safe and okay to feel. So um, self-harm is an expression of whatever emotion is going on that was not safe to express in the family of origin or wherever they were. So when you work with somebody who's a cutter, you help them understand that they are, you know, a precious bundle of light and please don't harm yourself because you're loved. You are. And this is a self-esteem issue. And let's start working on expressing those emotions and being okay with those emotions. So oftentimes when people come into my office and they're cutters, it's because they come from a family of origin that has been verbally abusive, emotionally abusive. There's some trauma going on. It's not okay for them to be them. It's not okay for them to express. It's not okay for them to um, have any sort of emotion. They have to be happy all the time, which is really scary. Um, and that is what abusers do. They do not tolerate any other emotion other than, because remember the splitting, right? All nothing good, bad. So they don't tolerate any other emotion other than happy all the time. Okay. And this is going to play into another question that I got about what's the script that the, um, abuser wants the family and the children to play in order to keep the peace. So hang on just a second. So, um, uh, so this is so cutting and self harm is an expression of emotions that have not been able to be expressed. It's some it's a way to express them. Is it healthy? No. And do we need to work on that? Absolutely. And it all has to do with giving yourself permission to have whatever emotion you are having. It is okay. And oftentimes, what an abusive family will do is they will say, "Don't you dare be mad." Don't you dare say that. Don't you dare feel that. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. And then where are the emotions going to go? They get stuffed. And then the person has no other outlet for it. And so that's when they turn to cutting. So it's a horrible situation to be in. And it's really important that if you are a cutter to really start working on giving yourself permission to have emotions so that you have a healthy way to let them out. Okay. There is that. Um, okay. Answer that. Answer that. Can you talk about the script that spouses and children are expected to follow to keep the peace with a narc. Okay. So abusers, like I said, have got splitting. Okay. They, they can't handle change. They can't. Everything has to go according to their plan. And if you'll notice when things don't go their way, they come unfucking hinged like boom and they explode and they get angry and they you know this that and the other thing and it's because things are not going their way they they don't have fluid thinking they don't the ones who do are the ones who have antisocial personality disorder because they can lie on their feet really fast okay so anyway so they don't have the fluid thinking and actually we're going to talk about that as well, because somebody had a question about what's the difference. So I want to talk about that. So the script for the family and the kids that have to go deal with a narc parent is you have to be happy all the time. You have to be completely, you know, quiet all the time. You have to agree with the abuser all the time. You don't get a chance to express your own feelings or your own thoughts or your own ideas or your own wants or desires or needs because the abuser is all about control and they're all about manipulating and controlling. And if you express that you're not happy, you know, a normal parent would be like, well, tell me more. Why, why aren't you happy? What's going on? You know, what's, help me understand. How can we, how can we work on this? What's going on? An abusive parent will come unglued and start doing either the martyr routine, I do so much for you, I put a roof over your head, blah, 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 blah. or they do, you know, somehow a make wrong, you know, like, oh, it's your, it's your opposite parent, whichever the opposite parent is. It's, you know, it's that person's fault. Instead of recognizing, hello, dumbass, you're part of the parenting problem. So, you know, it's like, if the kid's unhappy with you, then you might want to take a look in the fucking mirror. They never do. They're not introspective. They, they will not allow themselves to be introspective. It's too threatening for them to go, gee, maybe I'm wrong. You know? So, okay, Chance, what are you doing? Oh, we're, we're dog sitting. So we've got little Chance here. So he's kind of 
little tough guy. Um, he's a cute dog, though. Um, so parenting... So with, with a spouse that's abusive, that's narcissistic and abusive, or antisocial, or both, which is a really bad combination, and abusive, their script is there is no dissent. There is no, uh, no other emotion other than what makes them feel good. So if they're feeling good, you have to feel good. And if you're not feeling good, they don't want to hear it. They really, truly do not want to hear it. So for example, when I was a kid and I came home and I was getting bullied at school and all this stuff was going on, and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to talk to dad and see what he says. I must have been about eight or nine, maybe. And, you know, I said, hey, dad, I've got a problem. And he shut me down super fast and was like, well, you think you have problems. Let me tell you. And then he flipped it. It was all about him. And I'm just like, if I could have flipped him off at that point, I probably would have. Unfortunately, I didn't even know what the bird was at that point. But, you know, <laughs> anyway, so they do that. They, they flip it and they make it all about them. Well, you think you've got a bad eye, da, 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 I, 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 right? Okay, so they do that. So they're, it's all about them. Me, 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 I, 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 more my genitals. That's all they care about. Seriously, that's, that is their entire life. And if your narrative does not fit into their narrative, they don't want to fucking hear it. Whereas a normal parent would be like, oh my gosh, hon, talk to me. What's going on? Tell me more. Who's bullying you? What's happening? Why are you having a bad day at school? What's, what's going on? Maybe we need, need to talk to the teacher. Maybe we should bring the principal in. You know, it's like they would care. My mom cared. The, my dad did not. So, you know, and that's, that's basically the whole narrative is that it has to be about their wants, their needs, their desires, their everything. If they're not interested in it, they don't want to hear it. So another example, so, shameless plug while I'm doing this. So what's wrong with your dad? Hello. So this is my book. It's about growing up with a disordered parent who was also an opiate addict and an alcoholic. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him cha-cha is about why people stay in abuse. Some people leave, some people don't, and this is why. So it talks about why. Um, I was very interested in sports growing up. You know, I really, I wanted to play softball. I wanted to go be active. And my dad absolutely refused. He, girls don't do that, is what I got told. And then when I wanted to go see a baseball game, because I love baseball. Baseball. Oh, I love baseball. I do. I love baseball. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Again, it's the whole Victorian thing, I think. But it's like, you know, sitting and watching people and watching the game and watching people and watching the game and watching people, you know, it's to me, that's just infinitely fascinating. I love it. And the seventh inning stretch. That's my favorite. Get up and sing and stretch and sit down. So, um, but my dad refused to take me to a baseball game because he could care less. He, his thing, he would drag me to opera all the time. I can't fucking stand opera. I love some of the music. Some of the music is very beautiful. Madam Butterfly is gorgeous, but I'll tell you what, I hate the fucking stories because they're all fucked up and dysfunctional and everybody fucking dies. And I'm like, if I wanted to see tragedy, I'd fucking stay home and listen to my dad. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, uh-uh. So, you know, he would do things that he was interested in, but he refused to do anything that any of us kids were interested in because, it, it, because he didn't care. So the script for them is it has to be their wants, their needs, their desires, their hobbies, their likes, their dislikes, their everything. So that's what the script is. And you cannot vary from that because if you do, they will punish the living crap out of you. Anyway, I hope that answered the question. I, and, and to keep peace, you basically have to give up who you are as a parent, as a, as, a, as a wife or a husband or as a child in order to keep the peace with crazy. And here's the other thing. There will be times in the middle of the abuse that you can't keep the peace because they don't want it to be peaceful. They want a fight. They want a knockdown drag out. They want an excuse to hit the kid. They do. You know, my dad would absolutely come home and in his head, he'd already decided he was going to hit me. And then if I said something the wrong way, bam, you know, and then I'd be, I, 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 and then wake up on the other side of the room going, what the fuck just happened? And they do. You, there's, you can't, no matter how badly you try to keep the peace with an abuser, it's an impossible because they want the argument. They need the release you know, from whatever tension they have, and they've already decided in their head that they're going to abuse. They absolutely do. It's just like the abuse clock. Remember I talked about the abuse clock? You know, it's like, here's the honeymoon period at 12 o'clock. 
and then it goes around and then the tension starts building and they start getting weird and squirrely and by six o'clock is when the event happens where they hit or they scream or they call names or whatever and then there's the remorse period and then there's the oh my gosh I need to do something or they're gonna leave me period and then we're back into the honeymoon period so they've already decided they are sick they do not change you cannot help them no matter how you try to st stick to their script eventually they will abuse that's just the way it is guys you got to get the fuck out so there that is um, okay do abusers prey on people with bipolar disorder yes absolutely so here's the deal I talk a lot about how narcissists oftentimes what their favorite combination is is a narcissist with a borderline because borderlines in the lower end of the spectrum are you know empathic and very sensitive and you know they take things out on themselves and you know and so they love that they love that and their next favorite thing is people without borderline personality disorder that are empathic that's their favorite combinations right there so the next one that they love is anybody who has any sort of uh, disabling issue whether it is bipolar or borderline or depression or you know you name it if they can take advantage of it they will or somebody with disabilities that's you know that's another question that I want to make sure to talk about so um, yeah they will take advantage of anybody that they can have the, the higher ground quote unquote of so when somebody is going through um, bipolar issues okay and they're unmedicated Remember, it's bipolar one, it's up, down, up, down, up, down. And it, it, mood instability, okay? And when somebody is in an instable mood, it's easy to manipulate them. And these fucking predators know it. And they will push the buttons, 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 and get the person to explode, especially if they're in a manic phase. Or if they're in the depressed phase of it, they'll sit there and go, what's wrong with you? You're, you're, you're faking it. You're this, you're that, you, 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 you're, you're weak, you're lazy, you're this, you're that. They call all sorts of names. They're fucking assholes. So yes, they will go after people that have got bipolar. They'll go after people who are disabled. They'll go after anybody that, you know, people that are empathic, people that have got the lower end of the spectrum of borderline. Yeah, anybody that they think or know that they can poke 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 get them to respond and then oh look suddenly now the other person is the abuser that's what they do that is what they do that's why I keep saying guys revenge is a dish best served cold if you respond to these assholes you're gonna look like the crazy one and you will be the crazy one because you will have responded and reacted as opposed to acted so this is why I always tell people it's like yeah I know you think that revenge is gonna make you feel good it's not it's not it's not your job to punish them and you're behaving just like them when you do it so knock it the fuck off so there's that but um, secondly you don't want to give them anything you don't want to feed their ego you don't want to feed they're looking for that response they're looking for that reaction they want to see you pop they do. That's why you've got to gray rock and you've got to get the fuck out. So there that is. But do they prey on people that have other disorders or disabilities? Yeah, absolutely. If they think that they can manipulate you, control you, make you, push you to the brink, yeah, they'll, they'll do it because it's all about power and control for them. And they will use your disability against you and they will use your um, disorder against you. If it's depression, they'll use that against you. If it's bi bipolar, they'll use that against you. If it's borderline, they'll use that against you because they're predators. I want you to think sharks. I want you to think feeding frenzy. That's what they are. Okay, I hope that answered that question. Okay, um, domestic violence um, with disabilities okay so somebody wrote in and said it's incredibly difficult to get services um, when you have got disabilities yeah it is it is it's it's it is I'm sorry it is um, the domestic violence hotline though which I should probably look that up and tell you guys what that is hang on a second domestic stick Vi Ooh, if I could spell I'd be dangerous violence and disabilities there we go all right so it's www.thehotline.org slash is dash this dash abuse slash domestic dash violence dash disabilities thingy I don't know what the hell that is you know 
the thing that goes sideways. Anyway, so yeah, if you look up the domestic violence hotline, they've got a whole list of suggestions for people with disabilities, who to contact. Um, people cannot refuse you services, at least in the U.S., because we have the Americans with Disability Act, so shelters cannot turn you away, and I've heard of people having that issue. Um, Okay, and there's a whole bunch of resources for survivors with disabilities. Um, best colleges, government programs, scholarships, and helpful apps for disabled students, adult protective services, abused, deaf women's advocacy services, disability.gov, uh, safety planning for domestic violence victims with disabilities, safety planning for persons with disabilities advocate guide. So there's a whole bunch of resources on the National Domestic Violence Hotline. So that is a good place to go. Um, the other thing you're going to want to do too is you've got to be vocal and you've got to speak up and you've got to advocate for yourself. If you can get a social worker to get on your side and help you and be an advocate, do it. You know, if you can get a therapist, do it. So um, you're going to have to unfortunately do a lot of this stuff on your own, which really sucks. And it sucks for people without disabilities and it sucks for people with disabilities. Domestic violence sucks, period. So um, yeah, there are resources out there and it is difficult, but not impossible. Do not get up. Remember, squeaky wheel gets oiled. And if somebody violates the Americans with Disability Act, you turn them in. You absolutely turn them the fuck in. You turn them in because they're part of the problem. So, all right, I hope that answers that question. Okay, what is the difference between a narcissist and a sociopath? <laughs> Hold on. I got my little handy dandy DSM-5 here. Dun, 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 dun. So antisocial personality disorder. So, all right, back up, back up, back up, back up. So the DSM-5, DSM period, keeps changing names. It is very political. It is. And they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So we have gone from psychopath, which is what it is, to sociopath, to now it's called antisocial personality disorder. So basically what antisocial is, is the rules don't apply to them. The rules do not apply to them. They usually have been diagnosed with uh, oppositional defiance disorder um, when they are prior to 18, after 18, and if they keep getting in trouble with the law, then it is antisocial personality disorder. So in other words, the rules don't apply. But it is all cluster Bs. No surprise there. All right, hang on. So antisocial personality disorder is on 659, and I do not have reading glasses, so this is going to be really fascinating for me to read this because I'm going to be squinting. Oh, my God. Okay, hang on. So antisocial personality disorder. Okay, here's the criteria. Oh, good God. A pervasive pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others occurring since age 15, as indicated by three or more of the following. One, failure to conform to social norms with respect to lawful behaviors, as indicated by repeatedly performing acts that are grounds for arrest. Two, deceitfulness, as indicated by repeated lying, uses of aliases, or conning others for personal profit or pleasure. Three, impulsivity, or failure to plan ahead. Four, irritability and aggressiveness, as indicated by repeated physical fights or assaults. Five, reckless disregard for the safety of self or others, or both. Um, six, consistent irresponsibility as indicated by a repeated failure to sustain consistent work behavior or honor financial obligations. So people who are constantly running from, you know, paying their bills, like literally leaving a place that they were renting out the bathroom door or out the bathroom window and then, you know, leaving it behind, changing their name, going, getting another place, you know, that kind of thing. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> Lack of remorse, as indicated by being indifferent to or by rationalizing having hurt, mistreated, or stolen from another. That's antisocial behavior. B, the individual is at least 18 years old. C, there is evidence of conduct disorder. Ah, conduct disorder, not oppositional defiance, sorry, conduct disorder um, before the age of 18 or for, before the age of 15. So conduct disorder, not oppositional defiance disorder, although that can go hand in hand with antisocial as well. Um, the occurrence of antisocial behavior is not exclusively during the course of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Because again, when you're in the manic phase, you may do impulsive things, you may break the law, you may, if it's unmedicated. So yeah, absolutely. So that is 
Antisocial personality disorder. Now, narcissistic personality disorder. Do, 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 669. Hang on. Do, 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 do. Where am I? Where am I? There we go. All right. So, a pervasive pattern of grandiosity in fantasy or behavior, a need for admiration, and lack of empathy beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts is indicated by five or more of the following. One, has a grandiose sense of self-importance, exaggerates achievements and talents, expects to be recognized as superior without commiserate achievements. So, you know, these are people that brag about having done things when they really haven't. Um, is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Three, believes that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should associate with other special or high status people or institutions. So kind of wannabes kind of thing, you know, it's like, oh, we have to eat at this restaurant because this is the restaurant to eat at. It's like they won't eat at hole in the walls. They won't you know, go experience things that are less than, you know, what the stars do or what the politicians do or, you know, whatever, that kind of thing. Um, requires excessive admiration, number four. Number five, has a sense of entitlement, unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment or automatic compliance with his or her expectations. So these are the ones who walk into restaurants and start screaming at the maitre d' because they don't get seated right away, even though there's a waiting list. And the waiting list is 45 minutes long, and they didn't make a reservation. So, yeah, those people. Uh, six, is interpersonally exploitive. For example, takes advantage of others to achieve his or her own ends. Number seven, lacks empathy. Is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others. Number eight, is often envious of others and believe that others are envious of him or her. Number nine, arrogant, haughty behaviors or attitudes. Okay. So you will notice that antisocial and narcissism have a lot of similarities and a lot of overlapping. So when somebody is showing both of those disorders, they have a flagrant disregard for the law. They don't care if they've harmed somebody's feelings at all or hurt them in any way, shape, or form. And remember, as you go down the line, everything is on a spectrum. Everything is on a spectrum. So the further you get down towards malignancy over on this end, all of the disorders start to overlap, okay? And when you get to be, excuse me, when you get to be a dark triad, that is antisocial, so psychopath, with Machiavellianism, which is control freak, and narcissism. It's all three of those. So yeah, they're going to have a whole bunch of overlapping stuff. So when somebody is breaking the law, stealing things, um, harming somebody, not caring, showing no remorse, they don't care, they're above the law, they're better than that, they've probably got narcissism along with antisocial personality disorder. So yeah, they're no bueno and very dangerous. And there was another case, I can't remember where it was, in Idaho, where the boyfriend just has been arrested for killing the, uh, the girlfriend and there was a new baby involved. I think the baby's in protective custody now. But it, again, it's like these people, male and female, because females can be abusers as well, that believe they're above the law, that think they can get away with things like that. They're antisocial. They're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. So um, it's, they're dangerous. They're absolutely dangerous because they think that the rules do not apply to them. So mm. anyway, that is the difference between the two. Are they similar? You betcha. They're both cluster Bs. They're both cluster Bs. And as the person keeps sliding towards malignancy and enjoying the abuse that they're dishing out, the, all of the disorders start overlapping. And it's hard to tell what is what. So, all right, there is that. Okay, difference between narc and a sociopath. All right, gastric bypass, addiction, and cluster Bs. Okay, so, oof, all right. When somebody gets a gastric bypass, in the past, and I do not know about currently, but in the past, they didn't really insist that they get good counseling. They just insisted you got to go have four sessions. Well, okay, you could go have four sessions and be talking about great aunt Bertha or Margaret or whatever and have nothing to do with what's going on with the gastric bypass. So when somebody has gotten to the point where they are morbidly obese, 
okay, and they are going to die, or their health is going to be very, very affected by their weight, people will often go get a gastric bypass. What they have not dealt with, however, is the underlying addiction. So the question was, what is the correlation between addiction, gastric bypasses, and cluster Bs? That I don't know, but with this is what I can tell you what I know about addiction. When somebody is using a substance, whether that substance is alcohol, drugs, sex, exercise, food, whatever, there is an underlying addiction that they are not dealing with, which means there's emotions that they're not dealing with and they're trying to numb themselves. So with morbid obesity, it's with food. You know, they're numbing themselves with food. So when you get the gastric bypass, okay, great, the stomach is artificially shrunk and you're unable to absorb stuff, the alcohol rate, the alcoholism rate for gastric bypasses is huge, huge. It is ridiculously huge. And I don't think that they were warning people, at least in the beginning, when these surgeries were super popular, about the dangers of then going on to become an alcoholic. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very real possibility. What it, are the numbers? So, reported... 20% of every gastric bypass surgery goes on to become an alcoholic. Now that's the reported numbers, guys. Remember, there's a lot of people that go on to become alcoholics and they don't go seek help. So I'm guessing that those numbers are probably a hell of a lot higher. So um, it is a real thing. And when somebody is an addict, their behavior mimics a personality disorder. Because when you're in the middle of an addiction, you're selfish. You don't give a flying rat's ass about anybody else except you, 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 and your drug. And that's it. Whether that drug is alcohol, whether that drug is, is drugs, whether it's food, whether it's whatever, you don't care. You don't care because the addiction is driving you. And it can mimic a personality disorder. You're not going to be able to tell what's going on until the person gets clean and sober. And if somebody has had a food addiction and it's been unaddressed and the emotions have not been dealt with, then they can be what is known as a dry drunk. So let's talk about that. So in addiction, there's dry drunks. Okay, and I, I know I mentioned this in a recent video, but I'm going to mention it again. So an actively using drunk is a wet drunk. Okay, they're, they're, they're using. Okay, a dry drunk is somebody who has gotten clean and sober, however, they have all of the behaviors of an alcoholic, meaning they lie, they cheat, they steal, they uh, are angry all the time, they don't work on themselves, they have absolutely or very little low, no to low self-esteem. Um, they are uh, more interested in jacking up their endorphins and dopamines with anger than they are with really being real, real, excuse me. And um, they, uh, you know, they have all the behavior. They're, they act like a narcissist. They really do. So those are dry drunks. Those are people that have not worked on whatever underlying emotion was driving the addiction in the first place. Because if somebody's an addict, I can guarantee fucking to you they're trying to, to numb themselves to whatever it is they're feeling. Okay? So if it was food was the drug of choice, you get a gastric bypass and the person is just nasty and snarky and mean and na 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 They're a dry drunk. They're a dry drunk. That's what that is. And that means you got to address it. You got to go to a counselor and you got to work on the addiction. It was a food addiction. Absolutely. And you handle it no differently than you would any other addiction. So, you know, get the big book. You start working on it. You start working the steps. You start being honest with yourself. You start working on self-esteem. You start working on why did food become the uh, comforter? When did that happen? You know, how did that happen? And you just go from there. So um, can it mimic a personality disorder? Yeah, absolutely. And you're not going to know what's going on really until that person is clean and sober and is working on themselves. And, you know, if they're working on themselves or if they refuse to work on themselves, then, you know, you're dealing with a personality disorder because people generally, when they are malignant, absolutely refuse to go to counseling. Refuse. Like, they will not take a look in the mirror and take responsibility for anything that they have done. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's it. So, anyway, there that is. And the incident of um, addiction with gastric bypasses is huge, with alcoholism especially, because 
you, you, the stomach has been artificially shrunk. They're not getting the endorphins, dopamine, serotonins. They're not getting that high anymore off of the food. Oh, look, there's a bottle of wine. Well, I can do that, and that won't stretch my stomach out. And the next thing you know, they're downing, you know, redonkulous amounts of alcohol. And now they're alcoholics. So they went from a food addiction to an alcohol addiction. And there's a lot of other stuff involved in that. So in one of the studies that I read, it's because of the way that they rehook up the, um, the intestine and the stomach and all of this, and the way that the alcohol is absorbed into the body, and that it's absorbed much faster than it would be normally. And so, again, endorphins, dopamine, serotonins all get involved. It's not a good thing. So it, I would strongly, strongly suggest that it, you really look at your options before you decide to go for gastric bypass or any kind of invasive, you know, making the stomach smaller because there's so many things that they don't tell you about. And remember, it's a huge industry. It's a huge industry. And I think, honestly, it needs to be better... What's the word I'm looking for? Better oversight on it because I don't think that they're informing people completely of what the dangers are. And there are a lot of them. So yeah, I would not want to do that. And yes, there is the very real possibility of, of alcoholism or some other addiction. And yes, there is the very real possibility of complications. So yeah, anyway, there that is. And like I said, with an addiction on board, it's hard to tell what is the addiction and what is a personality disorder? Because sometimes you get the person clean and sober, they're working on themselves, oh look, the issue resolves. Because they, it was a low self-esteem issue, it was you know a, a, a trauma issue, it was whatever was causing them, driving them to the addiction in the first place, and if they resolve that, then they're fine. If they're unwilling to work on that, if they're unwilling to go to counseling, if they're unwilling to take a look in the mirror, then Houston, it's, it's a personality disorder. So anyway, there it is, all right. Okay, so I hope that answered all of the questions. Um, this Sunday on uh, We Need to Talk, I figured I'll just do a year in clearance and uh, you guys can ask me your questions. I want to talk more about uh, psychopathic parents and um, how they truly do not love their children and what to do to keep yourself safe. So that's going to be a thing I want to talk about. The other thing I want to talk about too is it's the new year resolutions, how not to set yourself up for um, self-sabotage, um, and then answer any questions that you guys have. Okay. All right, my loves. Well, that is it. And I um, cannot think of anything else. Oh, uh, the Eventbrite is up for California. I will be in San Diego for sure and Santa Monica. We're looking at maybe doing Santa Barbara. I'm not sure. We're going to have to take a look at the time period and, and where we can go and all that sort of good stuff. But for sure, Santa Monica and uh, San Diego. So there that is. And then in February and March, I will be in Louisiana, I believe. Oh, dear God. I need to look at a calendar uh, on the 23rd, I think. Hold on. Let me look at the year. No, I don't want 2018. I want 2019. That would be... Saturday the 21st. No, Saturday. The, no, where am I? March. Good God. Saturday the 23rd. So that'll be Saturday the 23rd in Louisiana in New Orleans. So there that is. That's what I know. And then in April, I'll be doing Texas. I'm not sure where. I know Austin and Houston is what we were talking about. And then in May, I'll be in Southern California again at a college. So um, there that is. All right. Uh, have a great day. And I will see you guys on Sunday. Bye.